<laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here. Uh, just a couple of announcements to make. Um, we have a prayer list out there, and I encourage you to take one with you if you would. Uh, we have folks we need to be praying uh, for this week and this past week, and we got some folks who uh, have surgeries coming up. We've got folks who have been sick, and so they need our prayers. They need our uh, reassurance through prayer. Uh, a couple other things. We've got uh, open windows. We still have these available if you'd like to take one with you. It's a great devotional guide to get your day started. It's a simple way to start your day, and it's also uh, filled with uh, prayer list of missionaries both here in the North America area and uh, around the world. And it's a great way to keep in touch with how to pray for our missionaries. But we support Melody Moon, and we're also supporting Annie Armstrong and uh, through the month of April. And this, this particular offering, 100% of it goes to support our missionaries in North America with supplies and things that they need. And let me tell you, right now, with all of the things that's happened, the storm damages, all of the setbacks that the nation has had recently, uh, weather-related, we have a lot of North American Mission Board missionaries who are supporting and helping churches. Uh, just in my home state of Louisiana alone, more than 100 churches are not functional right now, including the parsonages, and they're trying to get those repaired and get them back, and it's a lot of man hours and volunteer hours that are needed, and unfortunately, we're not able to get the kind of volunteers we had pre-pandemic over in the state of Louisiana, so there's a lot of needs out there, and uh, so when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, it helps support the missionaries who are doing missionary work. And I think that's everything we have. We have any other prayer? The ladies had a great time last week, last Monday night. Heard it was a big party and they didn't leave till after 8 o'clock. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like midnight for Baptists when you go past 8 o'clock for any kind of meeting. Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you for the sunshine and the rays of hope that it inspires for us as we look into a new week. Lord God, we pray that you'll speak to us and set us on the right path. Help us, Lord, to be walking close with you each day. And Lord, we ask that during this time of worship and in this time that we look into your word, that you will speak to us both in song and in the scripture. And help us, Lord, to walk by faith and not by sight. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask in the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, well, good morning, and glad to see you here this early this morning. If you would stand, oh, how I love Jesus. <clears throat>
Thank you. You may be seated. Oh, how I love Jesus because his love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else. manifest on an old rugged cross. Oh, yeah. 
Jesus manifest on the cross is the greatest story that has ever been told and we just need to love to tell the story above all names and there's just something about that name <clears throat> Redeemer, living word. 
would, take your Bibles open to the Gospel of John. We're going to be in the Gospel of John. We're moving now into the Gospel of John. We are 34 days away from Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Can you believe that? We are 34 days away, less than 30 days away from Palm Sunday. And uh, this continuous every night uh, thing that I've been doing up here since September 22nd uh, puts things in perspective very quickly how fast we go through time and how fast time passes us. So we need to make the most of our time, make, be good investors of what God has given us of our time. We're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, this morning. As we move now into the Gospel of John, making our way to the cross, that's our direction. We're on the road to the cross. Uh, these last uh, 107 days that were added because I miscalculated on the calendar. So I kind of figured that out. Now I'm using this old school approach with the old marker board here. And one of the things that you'll notice is it's not an optical illusion. It's actually leaning up and narrowing down in this direction because when I write, I do like this, and I guess that's what happens. And, uh, you know, I could, I guess, fixed it up more fancy and all that, but I don't know. It has a sense of charm for me personally, so... All right, we're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 3, and we're going to look at 25 words that are the most important words, I think, in all the Bible. Uh, the Bible begins with, in the beginning, and it ends with amen. But in the center of the Bible, there is one verse that summarizes the whole Bible, and it's John 3.16. It's spoken in the context of where Jesus has a man named Nicodemus, who is a ruler of uh, the Pharisees, he was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, and he comes to see Jesus by the cover of night. Uh, for God so loved the world, it is a very powerful verse indeed. Uh, it, you, it's one of those things we see everywhere. You watch old videos of old football games and Super Bowls and everything else, and that goal, you know, goal uh, uh, field goal winning kick, and you look down and there's that guy with that rainbow afro holding a sign that says john three sixteen. it's one of the first verses we teach our teach our children how to uh memorize and it is what martin luther said is the gospel in miniature it truly is the summary of the bible now we went through the whole bible in the first 100 days we had messages from every book of the bible and every one of them you can find jesus christ throughout the old testament and new uh, but even in the Old Testament, you will see evidence of Jesus Christ everywhere. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are found all through the Psalms. So here we go. In the context of this meeting that Jesus has with Nicodemus, we see some things that he says there in verse uh, 1 that gives us evidence that they understand, or verse 2, that we understand the evidence that they had about Jesus. He says... This man came to Jesus by night, Nicodemus, and he said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. We, we, who's we? Pharisees. Pharisees knew good and well he was a spectacular teacher. Some of them may have recalled meeting him when he was about 12 years old and he came into the temple for the first time at the Passover and he was stunning them with his questions and his responses at the age of 12. Some of them went back to those days and remembered him. We know that you, our teacher, come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Here we see a confession of truth at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. These Pharisees recognize that God's hand is upon Jesus Christ. They don't recognize yet that he is their Messiah. They do not recognize yet that he is God in the flesh. Just as we just sang, great selection of songs this morning ties very well to this passage. Because it talks about Emmanuel, God with us. They have yet to recognize that he is God in the flesh. But they do recognize he's come from God. Which is a profound statement. Uh, meaning that your origin is beyond something that we understand. So they're already on the cusp of recognizing that Jesus Christ is divine. They're on the cusp of it. 
And it says, no one can do these signs. So already the miracles that Jesus was performing was all over the place. They saw it. They had evidence of it. It was a transforming moment for them. They were stunned. They were startled. They were just overwhelmed at what they saw Jesus Christ do. So the second thing we see is that they had evidence of his signs, which is a fulfillment of prophecy that they knew among the prophets, that the Messiah would come and perform these signs. So he's doing that. And he says there's only one way that God is with him. They didn't say that you are God, but that God is with you. So they know that Jesus Christ has a definite connection with divinity, and they recognize this. So this is a great confession on the part of Nicodemus. Nicodemus may be representing uh, the Pharisees, or he may be coming to tell Jesus in the cover of night a confession of conversation they're having in private. We don't know which the motivation is at this point, but we do know is that Nicodemus is confessing to Jesus Christ the truth concerning the Pharisees at this point. They're going to know it, and then they're going to turn on him anyway. Jesus Christ will give uh, various parables that's going to prove that they don't want to release the power and the control they have over people in order to submit to the Messiah and to follow him. And that's the reason. It was pride, mostly, and control. Now Jesus responds, and he said to him, most assuredly, now in the Gospel of John, this is the phrase that you will see used. Uh, in the other Gospels, it will say, truly, truly, or verily, verily. Uh, John picks it up with most assuredly. I say to you, unless one is, one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is saying at that point with Nicodemus, you're, on the, you're close, you're getting close, Nicodemus, but unless you're born again, you're not going to see the full truth. You're not going to see the whole revelation of the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. That's why uh, Charles Spurgeon said, nowhere in the Bible does it say you must improve. It says you must be born again. And Jesus Christ is clearly saying that, which means you have to have a new birth. You've got to have a transference of your spirit with Jesus Christ. You've got to be made alive in Christ. You've got to have the old dead man brought back to life through the birth. And Jesus Christ talks about it being from born from above. It's a heavenly spiritual new birth. And he said, you're not going to understand this stuff until you have this born again moment. Now Nicodemus, and, and here's where humor is in the Bible. We overlook this. There's humor in the Bible. Jesus Christ says some things that are rather witty and uh, clever. And some of, some of the moments are just downright funny. But we don't find that there because we're a little nervous about being caught up in the moment. But Jesus answered and said to him these words, and then Nicodemus said in response, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus, as uh, Jerry Clower would say, he was educated beyond his common sense. He didn't understand. He was literal in his understanding of what Jesus was saying. Uh, but Jesus is talking about a spiritual truth, and he's getting it confused with a literal truth. And he's saying, I can't cry back in my mom's womb and come back out a second time, can I? I mean, how's that going to work? And then Jesus, again, says most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water being a physical birth, spirit being a spiritual birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He reiterates the idea there and clarifies it. So, which flesh is flesh, what spirit is spirit. Do not marvel when I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. There's a mystery about it all as well. And you can't see the wind. You can see the effects of the wind, but you can't see where it's coming from. You feel a distance, but you don't, know, you don't know where it originated. It's out there in the Pacific somewhere, the Atlantic somewhere, off the North Pole or South Pole or someplace. Some kind of turbulence or something gets it going. But we don't know where the wind's originated from. We just know it's blowing. It goes where it wants. Have you ever met anybody that could stop the wind? Apparently, we have some people who think they can control the climate. Well, as they used to say in Las Vegas, good luck with that. You're not going to change the climate. Nicodemus said, well, how can these things be? 
Now, in that conversation, here's what Jesus says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. We're going to see three things in this passage today. First thing we're going to see is the greatest giver that's ever been in existence. That's God. And he's the one who gives the greatest love. For God so loved the world. The word love there is a beautiful word. It means to uh, greatly prize and adore. He greatly prizes and adores the world. Now the word world means the cosmos, the whole universe. Now remember, Jesus Christ is talking uh, in uh, about 30 A.D. or so. He's having a conversation with this man. They do not have a Hubble telescope. They do not have any kind of telescope. They just see the stars in the sky at night and the darkness out there. They didn't have light pollution. And if you've ever been in an area that has no light pollution, when you look at those stars, you can distinguish almost a three-dimensional image as you look up into the heavenlies. You can almost see the a difference in distance between the planets and the stars that are floating through the night. It is a magnificent sight to see. Sailors tell me when they're on the aircraft carriers and things of that nature that the night sky is just an unbelievable thing to see. You can see the edge of the Milky Way. You can see all the brilliance of, the, of our part of the universe, our galaxy. And Jesus Christ is talking to this Pharisee, this man named Nicodemus, who's very bright, he's a very intelligent man, he's a highly educated man of his day, and he's saying that God so loved the cosmos, the whole thing, everything, he greatly prizes, adores, all of this. And people wonder, you know, well, the Bible, it's all made up, and it's all kind of, you, know, eh, you know, questionable at best. Ah, it's a lot of fairy tales. I don't know that I even believe that Jesus really existed. Well, my friend, I'm telling you, who can make that up? That Jesus Christ would say something like that, that God so loved, greatly prizes, adores the cosmos. The cosmos, everything, everything that exists, God greatly prizes and adores it. Why? Because in the beginning, it says, in the beginning, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created it all. He greatly prizes and adores what he's created. And the most beautiful part of it all is that he greatly prizes and adores you. He loves you. And we forget in the mass numbers of some, what, 7 billion plus people on the planet, we overlook the fact that God knows each individual. He knows each individual. He knows you. And Jesus even goes so far as to say he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows when a bird falls from the sky and dies. He's aware of all the life that's going on on this planet. Why? Because he's a creator. He's God. We put human limitations on God. God's beyond anything we can even fathom. We're just a part of that creation. But in the part of that creation, as we would look upon an atom... Through an electron microscope, we can't even see hardly any of that. But God doesn't see you as a speck of an atom in the universe. He sees you as an individual person. And he understands the feelings you have. And he understands the t fatigue that you have. And he understands when you're hungry and you're lonely, when you're misunderstood, when you're confused, when you're worried, when you're afraid, when you're angry. He understands all of that because he greatly prizes and adores you. And that's why he sent his only begotten son because he says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. He didn't just put him on loan. He didn't just send him. He gave him. He gave him to us. He gave his only begotten son. He created his son in the womb of a virgin. Jesus Christ has been and always will be. He's part of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Son was sent as a missionary to us. And he was given to us. That's the greatest expression of love is when you give something that's very personal to someone else, right? I mean, that's what you really appreciate the most. At Christmas time, uh, when my kids were in school, they were in art class over here at the school. And my favorite thing that I got every Christmas was something they created in the art class. It didn't mind the fact that 
when my daughter went to ceramics class and she made me a coffee mug, that it was, well, worse than this writing on this board. It was all cattywonkered and bent and could barely get your finger through the cup holder thing, the finger there, and I was afraid to put anything hot in it. I thought it would just completely fall apart, but I greatly prized and adored it. Why? Because her precious hands made it. And when my son uh, went to art class, he went and did a paper mache head of the character Squidward off of uh, SpongeBob. You remember SpongeBob? Oh, I remember I had to watch those things all the time. Uh, that and Thomas the Train. And so those were the things we did. Now I miss those days. But sometimes I'd get so irritated. Well, he made Squidward with the big nose, and he was the complainer, and everything was negative, and he was always one of those guys that he, he, was, the, he was the complainer. He was the pessimist of the group. And, of course, you had SpongeBob, big-eyed, and carrying a spatula, and he was always happy. And I said, uh, what is this, Matthew? He said, well, that's Squidward. I made him for you. He said, because Squidward reminds me of you. I said, well, thank you, son. I appreciate that. I said, well, you know, son, and then I tried to get philosophical with him. You know, Squidward was really a realist. You know, SpongeBob was living in a fantasy world. But that was a gift that I still have, that I still have on display in my home. That, that gift, <laughs> it's ugly, but it's beautiful to me because my son made it for me. And he gave it to me. And God gave us his only begotten son. He went through the process of being birthed from a virgin, coming into the world. He didn't come out of a cloud. He didn't come out of a cave. He didn't come off on a ship somewhere out of nowhere. He came into the world like the rest of us did, to identify with us, to recognize that world that we live in. He wants to see it from our perspective. God became a baby. You want to know how sovereign God is? You want to know how controlling he is? How much he's in control? He can become a baby and still control the universe. He can still do all things, even in the form of a baby. And he gave his only begotten son, his most precious gift. And I love all you folks, and I'm getting to know you more and more. But my friend, I got to tell you, I wouldn't give my son up for anybody. I just wouldn't. My little grandson, I'm just enamored by him. Can't get enough of him, but I wouldn't give him away to anybody. Especially to people who are going to hate him. People who are going to reject him. People who are going to uh, falsely accuse him and send him up on a cross. Would I want to do that? No, but God did. Why? Because he greatly prizes and adores the whole cosmos. And he greatly prizes and adores you. And the greatest of our sufferings is still nothing compared to his comfort when we need him. And he says he gave his only begotten son. Sent him to a place that was hostile, difficult. And in the end, sent him on the mission to become our sacrifice. And throughout all of Jesus' words and throughout all the Old Testament, we see evidence that Jesus Christ would have to shed his blood to get us a pardon for our sin. Because it's the only thing that God says is necessary if you want to come into his holy presence. You know, one of the reasons why people think that God's a mystery and they think, well, I'd, why didn't God just come out of the sky and show himself? Why didn't he come and reveal himself to us? Why, why didn't he show himself? He did. Right here, he gave his only begotten son. And the thing that's the most amazing to me in all of this is we, we want more evidence. That's not enough evidence. That's still not enough evidence. Well, he's a holy God. And he said, you know what? That's all I'm giving you. He created the universe. He can do what he wants with his universe. What did he do? He gave his only begotten son. God himself suffered. God himself went through anguish and pain. God himself, who had... Nothing but perfection and holiness. A sinless man, he became our sin. Our sin was laid on him. Think of that. Your sins were laid on Jesus Christ. And he carried him up to a cross to die for you so he could give you an exchanged life. You give him all of your bankruptcy, your spiritual bankruptcy, your failure, your sin. He said, I'm going to carry it up to the cross and I'm going to pay the price 
and, and redeem you of your spiritual bankruptcy. I'm going to recover you from your spiritual bankruptcy. And in the process of dying, and he says, to telestai, it is finished, which means it's paid in full. In return, he gives us his holiness, his righteousness, his right for us to become a child of God, to become part of the family of God. He lays his life down for you so your life can be picked up and made into a new person. So you have the right and the privileges and the honor of being part of God's family and live with him forever. That's what he did. That's what he did for you. He did it, why? Because God so loved the world. He so loved you. He greatly prizes and adores you. In 1 John, the same apostle who writes this gospel says God is love. He's love personified. He gives love, but he not only says he loves us, God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But I want you to see something over there again in verse 16. It says, for God so loved, past tense. Why is it past tense? Why is love past tense? He so loved. He didn't say he so loves. He says he so loved. Why? Because his love was already committed at Calvary. And the only way for this past tense love to become present tense in your life is you got to meet Jesus at Calvary. You got to come to the cross. You got to meet him. You got to recognize he died for you. And when you understand he gave his life for you, so that you in turn can have life in him, so that you can be born again, you're dead, it trespasses in sin, you're made alive in Christ Jesus. The moment you are born again, loved becomes loves. It becomes present tense in your life. If you read through the Gospels and you read through the Epistles, most of the time it says God loved past tense because it was all left at Calvary. And when his love becomes present tense in your life is the moment that whosoever believes in him, whosoever believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. That's when the greatest guarantee comes into play. So we have the greatest giver and the greatest gift with the greatest guarantee that whosoever, that means whosoever, that means it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, what you've done with your life, it doesn't matter. Whosoever is whosoever. 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 When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he took all the filth of every person that will ever have in their lives. The prostitute that's turned a hundred thousand tricks on the street, her sin went to the cross on Jesus. The person who was shooting up heroin in an alley somewhere near death, stealing and doing whatever they have to do to get the money, to get the drug, Jesus Christ took that sin for that junkie. Jesus Christ took the sins of every lie we ever said, of every evil thought we've ever had, of every wicked thing that we've ever thought about. He took it all up there. All of it. Everything. He took it all for us. Because it had to be paid. It had to be, it had to be pardoned. And a ransom had to be paid to pay for the pardon so you don't have to suffer the consequences of sin. And people say, well, God sends people to hell. No. Our sins send us to hell. You've got to be pardoned. And the pardon means it doesn't mean you're not guilty. It means you don't have to pay the penalty. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is this. That not only in the part about perishing, but having everlasting life, the perishing, you don't have to die for, because of sin any longer. You die because your body has been corrupted by sin, but your soul's been spared. But you have everlasting life. What does that mean? That means that you're justified. It's just as if you'd never sinned. So you have a pardon for sins that we're guilty of. You're guilty, I'm guilty. We're pardoned of those sins through Jesus Christ. But we're also justified, meaning we have the right to come into heaven because of Jesus Christ. Nothing we did, not of good works, lest any man should boast. It's faith in him. And the word perish means that your life not be destroyed. 
that whosoever believeth in him. That means faith, trust. It's not an intellectual understanding or comprehension, but it's a life-changing faith that transitions your life into his, his life into yours. You're made new, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that's faith. That's trust. That's an active verb there that means whoever believes. See, that's present tense verb. Loved is past tense. Believe is present tense. But in doing so, it makes the past tense love into a present tense love as you have faith in him. And you'll not be perished, which means you'll not, your life will not be wrecked, you'll not be wasted, not be squandered. Your life will have meaning and purpose. And you'll have everlasting life. Isn't that beautiful? Life, everlasting life. It's a beautiful thing to think about that Jesus Christ will give us that kind of assurance and that kind of a life. He gives us what we need at that hour. And he gives it to us forever. And heaven is a beautiful place indeed. It's beyond anything we can imagine. And our loved ones who are found in Christ Jesus, we will see them again. We will walk with them and it will be a place of great satisfaction. It's something that will be beyond anything we can comprehend. You're not going to get a harp and a halo and a pair of wings and float around in heaven. You're going to have a life that's going to be exciting. And as you look through the book of Revelation, it's a loud place. There's always activity going on. There's worship and there's praising and there's celebrating and it's a good place. And the gates are open. We'll be going places. We'll be doing things. We'll be seeing things. And we'll eat from the tree of life. It's a beautiful place. And here's what he says with this reassurance. He said, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Jesus Christ didn't come with an attitude of condemnation. He came with a attitude of love of service of kindness of mercy of goodness of acceptance one person at a time i like what billy graham said he said jesus christ didn't just die for all he died for each he died for you and why because he didn't come to condemn you he came to give you everlasting life. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Paul says in Romans. If you do not know Jesus Christ in this way, I encourage you to trust him. Put your faith and trust in him. Believe in him. and You will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. The goodness of Christ is always there for you. It's always there for you. D.L. Moody said, faith makes all things possible, but it's love that makes things easier. Jesus Christ made it as easy as he can for you. He took your place. He died for you to give you life everlasting. Let's stand. If you have a decision to make today of any kind, I'm here at the front to receive anyone. If you have prayer, if you have a concern, you got something on your mind, we're here for you at this time as we sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Thank you for being here this morning for our early service. Uh, we will be doing a mail out probably in the next two weeks or so, uh, promoting and letting folks know what we're going to be doing here for Easter Sunday and the weekend as well. We'll have a Good Friday service, we'll have a Saturday service, and then we'll have a Sunday morning Easter sunrise service, an early service, a meet and greet, and then a second service. And then I'll be done with 207 <laughs> days of this. And then I'll disappear. You'll never see me again. <laughs>
I'll take a break, but I won't do that. So if you want to reach out, take the hand of your neighbor. We're going to sing our song, and we're going to go out. Now, David's got a Bible study that starts at 10. Pat has a Bible study that starts at 10. Bart has a Bible study that starts at 10. I have a Bible study that starts at 10. We all start at 10. Okay. So, there we go. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel the sun. I'm a part of the family, the family of 